This is October 9th, 2001. We are in Natick, Massachusetts. And this tape is part of the Morse Institute Library's Continuing Veterans Oral History Project. My name is John Coates, and we're privileged to have with us today John Kennedy. Welcome, John. How are you today? Fine, thank you. It's good to see you. Uh, may I ask when you were born? I was born June 18th, 1925. You're 76 years old? Correct. And isn't today an auspicious date for you, the uh, date something happened in your life that you'll remember? It sure is. It's the anniversary, the 56th anniversary of the sinking of my ship at Okinawa Buckner Bay. I think we'll get to talk about that today here. <laughs> I'm glad you're with us. Uh, can you tell us uh, what your current address is? Framingham, Mass. And marital status? I beg your pardon? Marital status? I'm married, yes. And do you have children? I have six children. How about grandchildren? I have nine. Very good. Yeah. Okay, I always ask it, how about great-grandchildren? None. <laughs> None yet. Uh, where were you born, John? In Simpson, Pennsylvania. Simpson, Pennsylvania. It's a northeastern corner in the anthracite region of Pennsylvania. When I ask about your family, was uh, your dad a coal miner? Or no, Connected. my dad was a school principal. My mother was a teacher. Can you tell us about? And I had one brother. You had a brother. Mm -hmm. Can you tell us about growing up in Simpson, Pennsylvania? It was a typical coal mining town on northeastern Pennsylvania, with a population in its heyday of about five thousand, and uh, it, as King Coal went out of use, the population just slowly diminished and I guess there's maybe three, four thousand there today or twenty five hundred. How long did you and your family stay in the town? I lived there until I was eighteen and finished school and uh, then went into, into the Navy. After the Navy uh, in forty six I came home I attended the University of Scranton, which is a Jesuit institution in northeastern Pennsylvania there. And uh, after that, uh, I left the area and uh, lived in Philadelphia, New Jersey, and eventually Massachusetts. Okay, you've told us that you left, you finished high school. Yeah. Um, you grew. You were in high school then when the war broke out, I take it. When the it. war broke out, can yeah. Can you remember where you were on December 7th, 41? Yes, I can, vividly. I was in, uh, outside of Honesdale, Pennsylvania, in a place called Cherry Ridge, visiting some relatives. And it was a Sunday, and uh, we usually took rides on Sunday afternoon to see various relatives. This your fa whole family? Yes. Yeah. So you, somebody heard it on the radio, Robert Trout right. making an announcement. And uh, once, uh, there was no radio in the car, by the way, that we, oh, no, as soon as we <laughs> visited, we knew about it because there was, obviously the people in the house had heard it on the radio. Yeah, I'm not good at math, but how old were you then, John? I was, uh, let's see, about 16. And you heard that the country, uh, well, the next day you heard that the country was at war. Yes, we were all called into the auditorium of our high school. And we listened to President Roosevelt in his day of infamy speech. And uh, if I recall, I think one of the teachers that very day enlisted. What about you, 16 years old, and, and the guys you played ball with and went to school with? What did you think about this? Oh, we were indignant. We were shocked. Uh, needless to say, uh, it wasn't a way to, uh, you know, the feeling towards the Japanese in those days was absolutely uh, hateful. They. It wasn't uh, anything that could be nice could be said about them or anything. The whole town, in fact, uh, 
One family in my town had seven sons in the service. And if you walked down the street with your parents or anything in those days, and uh, people thought you were healthy, they would just question you why you weren't in the service, why you, uh, what was wrong with you. Uh, and to be 4F was a stigma that n nobody wanted, actually. So, why, don't, why don't you explain being 4F, what that 4F means? 4F means you were deferred because of some disability. A physical disability. A physical yeah. disability. And uh, I know people that uh, were, you know, very well, uh, could have been, you know, uh, not accepted and they just kept trying and trying and trying until one guy I know sp specifically, he tried so hard, he tried even after the war and they finally took him. Great. It was Good amazing. My whole high school class, all the boys automatically were inducted. Some volunteered. Some of the women, I don't know, I think some of the nurse, ones that be, eventually became nurses might have been involved. What about yourself, John, at 16? Did you know where Pearl Harbor was? Didn't have a clue. Did you know anything about the Japanese or the embargoes on them or mm -hmm. anything of that? No, it was a typical small town, probably very parochial in its outlook and uh, very ethnic oriented. Uh, there was various groups of people and that was it. Pearl, Pearl Harbor was another world away. So at 16, um, were you subject to being drafted? At at 16, no. That is to say, was there a draft? At 18, yeah. you uh, registered. So you began thinking for two years about the yes, service. Yes, I had tried to, uh, I had visions of becoming a naval aviator and uh, went down to Philadelphia and uh, took the physical and mental test there. And believe it or not, I was, a half decent basketball player in those days and they found on a hand what they called a hammer toe and they wanted to operate on it. And, uh, I just said no I don't want my toe operated on and uh, I went across the street to the Army Air Force to enlist and believe it or not. That's when you were? This was when I was 17 because I was trying to beat the draft. Okay. I was and it was the, Actually, it was the thing to do uh, because I had uh, some of the fellows left my high school class and got their diplomas in absentia, and uh, so they could have a choice. Is that yeah, you know? just so you right. But believe it or not, after we were drafted, uh, some people that were in my group actually were sent to the Marine Corps as draftees, and I ended up in the Navy and uh, most of them ended up in the Army or Air Force. Would you have gone, you said you went across the street to the Army. Yeah. Would you have joined the Army? Absolutely, I wanted to fly, that was it. And uh, it was, I guess, maybe just the, you know, the thing to do when you're 17 years old. Or, and it was uh, a very glorious thing at the time, too, because uh, the aviators were like the golden-haired boys of the fleet. I guess they still are. <laughs> but you didn't become an aviator? No, unfortunately. The irony of it is I passed the Army physical and flung the Army mental test by a couple points or a half a point, whatever it was, and it was an easier test than the Navy gave me. And when I was in boot camp, I got a call to go to, uh, my mother did, she sent me the card to go to Lackland Air Force Base for training in the Army because they had lowered the standard just that half a point or something, and I made it. And by, I was already in a boot you were, camp by you then. You were committed by then. Yeah. Tell us about joining the Navy. Where did you do that? We were sent down to the nearest large city, which was Scranton, Pennsylvania. And uh, there you were, Scranton and Wilkes-Barre had centers where you were given physicals and induction centers. And uh, basically that's where we were inducted. 
at Scranton, Pennsylvania. Mm -hmm. When you went into the Navy, um, did guys go with you that you knew, uh, part of your high school group or somebody from the town? Uh, several from the town uh, and uh, the adjacent town, which was Carbondale, Pennsylvania. And uh, we all went to boot camp together, yes. Had you ever been out of the region before? Only down to, uh, well, I'd been, I had been to New York, uh, the New York World's Fair in 39 and 40, the family, and... Uh, the Trilon and Paris Trilon Fair. Trilon and Paris Fair, yeah. exactly. And uh, uh, other than that, I was pretty much confined to the area. So now you find yourself on a train or We got on a bus that yeah. took us to a train and the next thing we knew we were in Sampson, New York, Upper State, New York. And uh, I was probably the most disillusioned 18 year old kid in the world because I had an armful of shots. They were shots on either side and they were dragging their uh, a mattress cover full of your uniforms and whatever <laughs> and bedding. What so, had you expected? Why were you disillusioned? Oh, I was just, I don't know, maybe I was a little homesick the first day. Maybe it was because uh, I uh, didn't feel too comfortable with all these various shots in my arms and uh, <laughs> dragging this heavy mattress cover full of gear that eventually became our sea bag. You went into a barracks? Uh, yep. yep, and we lived in barracks. How big was Samson? How many guys were there? Do you oh, have any idea? God. That's a big place. It was it? a huge place. Wasn't it just the counterpoint to Plattsburgh? The, the, one of the bases up in It was near, up near Rensselaer, up near Troy, I think it was. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, they, uh, I know it was very cold. It was October, November when we were up there, and it. Uh, and I guess we were there for twelve weeks or three. Yeah, about th twelve weeks, three months. This is October of nineteen forty-three. You're yeah, in the 43. Navy. You're in boot camp. Yeah, and you're in boot camp. How long? But I guess it was twelve weeks, maybe ten or twelve weeks, because as the war progressed. The training got a little shorter, <laughs> and uh, from there I shipped out to, uh, well, you were given a, I think it was a seven day leave at the time at the end of boot camp, and then from there I went to a school down in Bainbridge, Maryland. At Sampson, um, was that the place you took tests to determine what you would do in the Navy? Yes. Tell us about that, the testing procedures. Uh, I forget what they call it. I think it was a general classification test, the GCT or something they referred to it as. And uh, fortunately I scored fairly well and I was accepted at this for further training. At Bainbridge? At Bainbridge, Maryland. And where, what were you trained to do? I was uh, in the quartermaster school, and that was visual communications and navigation. In other words, uh, I would stand signal watches, I would uh, determine the estimated time of arrival once we were given orders to go to wherever the, the designated place was, and we would figure ship? out a chart. Uh, yeah. I would take a set of charts and with an officer, usually, uh, you know, plot the course because uh, they were general di uh, directions as where you were going, but however, each ship plotted its own course, even though you were in a convoy, but you had to determine the estimated time of arrival and the uh, speed of the ship and uh, weather conditions and uh, uh, we were also responsible for what was known as a rough log which is written by the quartermaster and in turn 
the officer writes what is known as a smooth log, and that eventually goes into the Bureau of Ships or wherever archives they have. Uh, the official history of the, the ship. The official history. D does the kind of work you're describing suggest that you worked on the bridge of the ship yes. with the officers who were running the thing? Yeah. That's I pretty important work. Uh, uh, it was pretty interesting, yes. And uh, then, you know, you would shoot the sun uh, for d navigation purposes and uh, with a sextant and uh, determine, you know, your position, which was also uh, determined uh, you had to combine that information with a chronometer that kept the, t uh, the Greenwich time. And uh, you also kept a log on that because uh, each uh, noon on uh, every day from Washington, they send out what is known as a time tick, and uh, which gives you the exact time of uh, noon, I believe it is, in Greenwich, England. Uh, and uh, of course, from there, you would plot if your uh, chronometer was minutes early or later seconds because that determined when you were figuring out your position, the longitude where you were. And uh, so, you know, it was quite important to keep the records pretty up to date. If, if you're told to go from point A to point B in a convoy, yeah. how can you tell when you're going to get there when you have to wait for the slowest ship in the convoy? We were one of the slowest. <laughs> oh. <laughs> Our top speed was probably 11 knots an hour, and uh, so everybody waited for you. Well, basically, uh, actually, the the ships are pretty much uh, unless destroyers or cruisers, which would be a much faster and bigger ship, would like circle. Uh, they would have a patrol going around the convoy to keep it in. From Bainbridge, uh, you're now describing sea duty. Yeah. How long were you at Bainbridge and when, when did you get on your first ship? From Bainbridge, we went to uh, Little Creek, Virginia for amphibious training, it, which is now a SEAL base in, uh, on the East Coast. And uh, from there, well, the school at Bainbridge, I think, lasted about three months. Then uh, we went to uh, Little Creek, Virginia, which was the amphibious training area. And that, uh, I don't recall just how long we were there. And but from there, we went to Houston, Texas. And that's where the ship was built and commissioned and we boarded it. Okay, what, what kind of a ship was it? It was the LSM-15, which is a landing ship medium. It's about 206 feet long with a 32-foot beam, which was also one of my quartermaster duties, to knowing how long and <laughs> how wide the ship was. In case you had to go through the Panama. Yeah, and, uh, and then for fuel, you know, and water and uh, different capacities. Tell us your feeling about seeing the ship for the first time. Were you disappointed, God, it's little? Or you think that's a great looking ship? How did you feel about it? We were kind of proud of it, yeah. We were, uh, you know, this was our, our home away from home. And uh, who was we? The crew, we had uh, 55 men and five officers. You had a captain, an exec, communications officer, an engineering officer, and a supply. And, um, <clears throat> and of course, since it's such a small ship, they had other duties than that, too. They were division, they were officers of the deck, and they were, so. And it was a very close-knit crew, needless to say, uh, when you get about 60 people living in an area 200 feet by 32 feet wide, uh, it, Gets rather cozy at times. You better like each other. Yeah. <laughs> yes. So and you set sail out of and went down the Houston Ship Channel. And from, yes, and from there we went to Galveston, which was uh, on the 
Gulf of Mexico and from the, took our shakedown cruises in the Gulf of Mexico and the training, it was constant training between uh, battle stations, fire drills, uh, abandoning ship drills. Was this early 44 now you've... Uh, this would be in, yeah, 44. Uh, early 44. Was, no, it was, uh, we picked up the ship in June of 44. It was mid-44. June 44, you're, you're on your way. Yep. And just about this time in the Pacific is the Battle of Saipan. Uh, oh, yeah. Uh, and... Was any we talk... And D-Day. Um, uh, pardon me? And D-Day in Europe. D-Day was June 6th, yes. Yeah, so you are sailing under auspicious times. Uh, yes. A lot's happening. Did you care whether you went east or west, Pacific or Europe? Did you have we a We pretty much uh, were convinced we were going to the Pacific because of uh, the need at the time. And... Uh, since D-Day has already had taken shape and was in its planning. We weren't part of their plan, so we just went to the Pacific. On a ship like this, what, what is a ship like this <clears throat> excuse me, meant to do? What does it function? It's, uh, well, it's uh, meant to carry uh, men and equipment into a, a beach and uh, we could uh, handle uh, five tanks and their crews, or the equal number of... Uh, in uh, the Philippines, we took in tanks, in trucks. In uh, Okinawa, we took uh, 155 long toms, they call them. The one, it's a howitzer, 155-millimeter. <clears throat> and we got there a couple days before D-Day. Don't, don't jump ahead. Okay. I, I want to get this very carefully. Okay. It's, um, yeah, the chronology is getting yeah, out of it. Yeah. Um, for somebody listening to this tape, uh, I've got you on a ship and it's June of 44. Okay. Where did you, where did you go on your first voyage? Other than we went down to uh, the Panama Canal, uh, went to Cocosola, which is on the east coast of Panama, and then you go through the canal, and the Panama City is on the west coast of Panama. From there, we went up to uh, California, uh, had some work done on the ship in one of the shipyards there. This is, an <clears throat> this is a new ship. What kind of work would oh, they be doing uh, on it? There are always designing. In other words, they took off uh, a 20 millimeter gun on the bow and installed a 40 millimeter gun, which was the highest caliber gun we had. And uh, oh, there'd be safety features that somebody, uh, you know, eventually caught up in their design that maybe they didn't get put in in the ship uh, yard where it was built. Uh, on the conning tower, we added a signal uh, cage where a signalman or a quartermaster could stand and use semaphore to uh, communicate with other ships, things of that nature, it's, even though it was a brand new ship. <laughs> That's all right. Bring, bring it up to date. Where did you go from there? We participated in a couple uh, landings. Uh, they had some training uh, exercises at San Clemente Island and Frank, Franklin Roosevelt, I think, come out to watch them. And we took uh, different uh, groups of Marines in, part in participating and was also training for them as well as us to uh, land in uh, San Clemente and Oceanside, California and places like that. So were you stationed at based rather at, at San Diego? Well, it w we would be, uh, originally we were in a, what was known as the, the destroyer base, which was San Diego. And then uh, we were up to Long Beach, California, uh, for, and um, it seemed in the, another, uh, we had to have some more repairs done at that place because, uh, I don't know, a propeller or something, a bow door got screwed up in one of the 
mock landings that, uh, for the training. So it was that kind of a maintenance as well as, you know, from one shipyard to another. Did you guys have a feeling it's time to get over and... Uh... Oh, everybody was gung-ho until the first couple air raids and, uh, you know, it was... A, uh, uh, yeah. Everybody on the ship was 18 or 19 years old. The captain was 29, and the nobody old, could figure <laughs> nobody could figure out how you live to be 29 years old. You know, it was just that attitude. Yeah. And of course, uh, you know, the first air raid was uh, kind of a waker upper. And uh, you, you haven't sailed across the ocean yet. Tell well, us about that. Well, we're going. We went from uh, uh, the San Diego area over to Hilo, which is uh, the, on the big island of Hawaii. Mm -hmm. And uh, from there, we lost a fella. He was out swimming and got caught in the undertow. And as far as I know, he's buried in the Hilo Cemetery in Hawaii. Isn't it unusual to, to go into Hilo instead of Pearl Harbor? Why did you go to we Hilo? Went, because uh, we had a bunch of Marines uh, aboard that were we took to, uh, it was a truck outfit, and we took them over to the island Hawaii, which is where Hilo is located. And from there, we went to Pearl Harbor. Okay. You know, well, we ended up in Pearl eventually. Now you're on your way. Uh, about when is this? What time of the year? Oh, gosh. Uh, this. Had to be in uh, September of 45, because in October, Leyte was invaded in the Philippines. We were, oh gosh, it was, uh, yeah, August, September, somewhere in there, of 45. You're sure it was 45? I, I ask you that only because in June of 44 you were d on the West Coast. Yeah. So all that time you were on the West Coast? Well, not all that time because you were always out on training cruises. You were out uh, with different groups. That's probably a better history. And of course this is just one fella's version of uh, the history of the, the ship. history yeah. of the ship if this and was maybe it was a little earlier than uh, you know the, but it had to be in the July August time frame of 45 that we were just uh, we seem to have missed all of Okinawa then no Okinawa didn't occur until uh, April oh wait a minute I beg your pardon I I am messed up. You're not messed up. You're talking about something 55 years ago or something. 50, yeah. Uh, yeah, because Okinawa, Okinawa was, was April, April 1st. 1st. Yeah. Because I can remember it was April Fool's Day, it was Easter Sunday, and it was D-Day at Okinawa. So, uh, so this was... Uh, when I said uh, September of 45, it was September of 44. Okay. We're, we're because back in, in yes, because the Leyte was in, uh, uh, the invasion of Leyte was in uh, October of 44. Okay, we're moving along. Yeah, now I'm straight, All right. straightened out. <laughs> Tell me about, uh, you're, you're in the Philippine Islands then. You left Pearl. And we left Pearl and there? we went to a whole bunch of places because um, basically, Besides delivering men and uh, equipment to the various beaches that were going to be invaded, we also acted as a, a supply ship. We would unload uh, provisions and bring them into various uh, locations throughout the Pacific. One of these and places, that time excuse me, one of these places that uh, we have in our notes here is Guadalcanal. Yeah, that you touched in there. Guadalcanal was um, August of 42. Two. So, so when we went down there, we picked up some uh, men and their equipment and brought them up uh, in preparation for the Philippines. 
And, Can you uh, tell us about being at Guadalcanal, what you saw? Or well, was uh, it was, uh, needless to say, it was a couple of years after the action uh, in Gua the invasion of Guadalcanal. However, I understand you could still get killed down there because uh, they, the Japs never surrendered. They just uh, hold up and uh, every now and then they'd pick off a guy in a chow line or something like that. Same and like, uh, Did you go ashore? Oh yeah. And uh, we also hit Tulagi and Bougainville and it was either on Tulagi or Bougainville that they ha uh, there was a huge billboard with painted black with white letters and it was kill Japs, kill Japs, kill Japs. If you do your job well you will help kill the yellow bastards and it was signed by Bull Halsey. And uh, I had pictures of it, and uh, well, of course, when the ship sunk, they, they <clears throat> went down. For for our future historians or past historians, Bull Halsley was an admiral in an the admiral, United States um, Navy. Uh, yes, and he, and that's he, a direct quote I take. It, it was because he um, he was kind of a he was the patent of the Navy, I think. Kind he was of kind of pugnacious, yeah. <laughs> yes. And uh, bulldog. He looked like yes. a bulldog. He threatened to ride Hirohito's white horse until they convinced him that it was a religious symbol and it would not be appropriate. So, <laughs> Tell us about some of the other islands and, and, and going ashore and what you saw around you. Were there great fleets at all times or were you guys pretty much alone? Uh, no, we usually, uh, usually the amphibs well, would be a squadron. It'd be, I guess, eight ships or usually. And we were pretty much on our own except when you went into a, an invasion. And uh, then, of course, you're there with the fleet. But uh, I can remember going to uh, New Guinea and Hollandia and Finchhaven. And uh, the people that were on the beach there were, uh, I mean, they were strictly out of the Stone Age. They come out of the jungles and they, uh, they just, <laughs> they were different. <laughs> they uh, just, uh, they, had, they had some sort of dye that they could color their hair with. And you would see, uh, and they were basically uh, Negroid uh, on, as opposed to Caucasian and uh, they would have yellow hair or orange hair, or uh, and they uh, chewed on some sort of uh, I you know I guess it was a dope or something, and made their teeth all uh, like rotted or way, and uh, they had sores on them, and they they were just a, a very very uh, crude. I can't say crude, but I mean a, a very. Uh, Pretty primitive people. Primitive is the word I'm yeah. looking for, yes. John, you were about 20, 21 at this time. What did no, you No, I was, uh, and uh, that would be, no, I was 19, yeah. Because uh, in June of uh, 45, I would have been 20. So. What, what, what were your feelings? Look where you are. You're way down in the South Pacific, going to some islands that people don't go to oh, yet, yeah. and and you just described the the Stone Age people of New Guinea. The Stone Age is what they yeah. really looked like. What 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 did you think about all of this? Actually, uh, it was a situation where uh, we were kind of awestruck or inquisitive about them because uh, you know, and these are like you say, eighteen, nineteen year old kids that came from every area in the United States all thrown together and uh, we just, you know, to us it was something that uh, almost beyond our imaginations. You talked a moment ago about uh, some of the invasions you participated in. Tell us about what it's like to be a part of that kind of a, a fleet. Well, Actually, uh, 
you're in usually some air raids and things of that prior to the invasion itself. So the first time I can remember being in the first air raid, everybody thought it was a joke up until it happened. And they made out phony wills, you know, and they'd leave your handkerchief or your blue jackets manual to the next guy or something. And it was, uh, you know, <clears throat> but when reality set in and they started really shooting and you're really, uh, you know, you're kind of uh, shaken up to say the least. What was your job during an air raid? During the air raid at general quarters, I would be on what is uh, the, the wheel, uh, the helm of the ship. I would steer it. And when you go into a beach, you, and the, of course the wheel is in the pilot house and the conning tower is just above it. And, and uh, you want to land that ship straight in because you don't want to get caught sideways and have it broach on you or anything else. So we used to play with the, the rudder and the enunciator which control the engines and uh, to keep the stern of the ship into the surf so you would be able to withdraw with the... <coughs> we would drop an anchor which is known as the, uh, the rear, the stern anchor and that would of course help us retract when we had to get off the beach with the engines in reverse obviously and uh, if the, that were not possible then and you did broach or get stuck uh, they usually had some seagoing tugs or something that would have to drag you off the beach. On whose command would that, was that anchor dropped? Yours? No. That would be an officer, usually uh, the captain at that time. In general quarters, he's on the bri uh, up on the con on the bridge. Up there on top of the ship, Yeah. when you had these air raids and strafing and bombing, aren't you in a kind of vulnerable position? Yes. Kind of exposed up there? It is. And uh, actually, uh, and the skin on these uh, amphibious craft was not exactly uh, very thick it was uh, and uh, but we always uh, we always felt that uh, this ship was our 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 nest our, our way of uh, our home Your a place, place to be safe yeah. and uh, and I know uh, when we took somebody into the beach they couldn't wait to get off they wanted to get inland uh, that was their way of feeling secure when you were carrying a couple of platoons of Marines on board, or Army or whatever. Whatever, yeah. Did you ever get down and talk to these guys? Oh, sure. And uh, they, some of them had been there, and the, the ones that we took off from Guadalcanal had been there for one long time. In fact, some of them, this was an <laughs> Army group, had trained at, uh, over when they were drafted, they got sent over to Pearl Harbor for their basic training, believe it or not. And they, Pearl? Yeah. Well, whatever stations were there to yeah. train them. And those guys were convinced that they were never going to come back. And uh, I can remember, you know, if there was an air raid or a dog fight. They'd, they'd stand up on the uh, outside deck and just bet on who's going to win, uh, you know, what airplane was going to get shoot what one down. and. Uh, they would, uh, be, you were supposed to keep them down below decks, especially during an air raid, but these guys, they weren't staying below decks. They were just, they were fatalists. They, and uh, it's amazing because I know one guy, uh, we had a sort of an overbearing boatswain mate who was gonna insist that they stay below. And this guy just picked up his rifle he says, we're coming up, and up they went. That's a good persuader, isn't it? Yes, it is. Were these Army or Marine Corps? The, this specific case was Army, yeah. Tell us about going into a beach and watching those doors open and all these guys go out. Uh, the, at the Lingayen uh, invasion, which was in uh, January of 
they uh, we went in at night, and uh, it was uh, it was crazy with the anti-aircraft fire and the tracers and all that. You know, you could just it was just one, and for every tracer you saw, there was four bullets in between, right? Because every fifth one, on a, at least on a twenty millimeter, was a a tracer. This is at night. This is we were in it going in at night. Yeah. How did you find that spot on the beach? You were supposed to. Live? There's. Was there somebody on the beach pulling you, yeah, calling you in? There's a, what is known as a beach master. Okay. And he would direct you into a, a specific location. Now, don't you have twenty, thirty, forty more of these? Oh yeah. On either side You're of going you? in. It's a precise drill. Let me tell you, because uh, you cannot. Uh, you know, you can just have a collision. But uh, like I say, once, uh, because I would be on the helm then, and I would pick out a palm tree or something like that, just to keep it aimed at that and to keep the ship on course. And uh, once you're on the beach, you maintain that by uh, using your um, engines and your rudder to keep uh, the ship aligned. What if the guy next to you picked out the same palm tree? <laughs> that wouldn't be good. Uh, in fact, in the, uh, one of the history, the history of one of the fellas wrote, uh, that evening, or that e uh, when we went in uh, to Lingayen, they, uh, uh, some pontoons broke loose. I guess they were like a temporary dock or something and tore holes in the side of our ship that had to be repaired. And uh, obviously it wasn't uh, to the extent where they would flood the ship, but there were some good sized holes in there that were uh, permanent, uh, yeah, temporarily patched and then later on we had them permanently patched. Where would you get fixed up? Would you have to go all the way back to any we talk or? Uh... No, they had uh, some, uh, well, it, in fact, I was picked up by, uh, I'm getting ahead of myself again, after the ship sunk, I was picked up by what they call is a repair ship, and they had all kinds of facilities. And there was also uh, an LSD, which was a landing ship dry dock, which was seagoing, and they would work on your uh, repairs there. But if, and if they were above the water line, you know, that, that, they just bring some guys aboard with some welding and patch it up. Yeah. Where did you go from the Gulf? From Lingayen, we went to, we stayed at Lingayen for quite a while because we had on, uh, once you're material and mineral ashore, you have to bring the, all the supplies in. So we would make trips from, say, uh, a provision ship or a personnel carrier, if they more men or more provisions to bring into the beach. So you would land, you'd be going in and out of God knows how many times. How far out was the supply sh uh, fleet? These, these are larger transports. Oh yeah, they're what they How were. far away were they? They're a couple miles out, I would say. Yeah. You guys would have to go out, yeah. load up. Load them up, in, bring them in. Yeah, ferry the supplies. And unload them. And um, then, uh, and then the larger ships we used to bring. Uh, the larger ships had these uh, oh, powder bags, I guess is what they call them, and they were contained in like uh, an oil drum or something uh, around, uh, and uh, once they used the powder bags in the larger guns, these containers had a, we'd take them and dump them on the shore, or get rid of them. And uh, just, it would be a bunch of uh, just gut chores back and forth of that nature. Were you under attack? And sometime, yeah, because there was always a, a continuous air raids uh, but uh, and you're and you're carrying only a forty minute, uh, forty millimeter uh, with, gun, right? That's with, all you had. Uh, no, there were twenty millimeters. There was about six tw twenty millimeters, three on each port side, uh, three on a port side, three on a starboard side, 
and up on the bow would be the 40 millimeter. And uh, yeah, that was our armament. And uh, it was, uh, you know, we always felt that uh, they'd pick on bigger ships. We were the little ducks in the pond. They didn't bother us until we got to Okinawa where they were. Every, everybody everybody was in trouble there, yeah. yeah, because it was their last stand. But, uh, and then, uh, in fact, at Lingayen Gulf, I think it was the uh, California that uh, some kamikazers uh, just come in out of the sun and That's hit That's a battleship. There. That's a battleship, about. the California. And uh, it landed right in a bridge, and they unloaded dead sailors and marines off that for days on end because it was, it didn't sink the California, it just damaged the superstructure and then of course they would always aim for the bridge because that's where usually the combat information center and the nerve of the ship was. The captains, the officers and their... Did, did, did you see this happen? Yes. Can you tell us watching a plane come in and striking uh, a ship? Well, usually they come in right out of the sun. So you didn't, you could hear them, but you couldn't, you know, you'd look up and you're looking straight into the sun and the glare, but you could eventually see them. And uh, I can remember the day that California got hit, there was an English uh, old uh, four stack, uh, I guess it was a cruiser or destroyer or something. And uh, they were alert enough where they, their anti-aircraft was able to just bounce the, the explosion, knock the plane up in the air just enough to take off the funnels of the ship that didn't hit the, the deck, air, I mean the bridge itself. And uh, of course, the California wasn't as lucky, they just, it, a couple of them landed right in there, right into the bridge. Uh, what are you guys doing uh, at that time? Are you firing at these planes? We would be, or? yeah, we, we would be at general quarters, which was, uh, everybody was alert and at their battle stations. And uh, if you were within range, you know, you would shoot at them and you would have, uh, it wasn't just an individual thing, you would wait for a command from the bridge to shoot. And once again, 20 millimeters didn't go that far, neither did 40 millimeters, so they'd have to be awfully close for us to get into the act. Say that again. Um, you've got three gunners on each side, yep. the guys on the bow and the 40, minute, the the 40, 40 millimeter. millimeter tubs. Uh, they have to wait to be told to fire? Pretty much so, yeah. It's a controlled thing because on each gun, there's usually the gunner, a loader, and a talker and the talker is in communications with the uh, bridge at all times. And they would, uh, but I'm sure some guns got fired if things got close enough uh, without waiting for the word. That, that's about my, my impression of uh, fire yeah. aboard a ship, that yeah. when something comes your way, you shoot at yeah. it. But then that, that suggests that there was a, an observer on your ship watching the, the aircraft around Oh yeah, you. because yeah. during general quarters, the captain is on the con, on the conning tower. See, our, our ship is a, a little different. We had a conning tower and uh, like a submarine almost, and right below that is the pilot house. I would be in the pilot house. The captain and his officer, usually executive officer at the time, is on the bridge with a talker and they would direct, you know, either change of course or fire. But like yes, a, to answer like your a, question, there was yeah. somebody up there all the time. Exactly like a pilot of a plane then. Yeah. Okay. All right. Um, any more about Lingayen before you leave there? No. Uh, we were there for a few days, I think. Uh, well, we were there for more than a few days, but I mean, uh, I don't recall exactly where we went right after that. It was back to uh, 
you know, get ready for the next invasion, which would be, uh, well, we weren't in the Iwo invasion, Iwo Jima, we were, got there. That was at, February. Yeah. Pardon me? That was February. Yeah. And uh, so the, we were still in the Philippines. We did get to Iwo after, oh, God knows when it was, but it was between uh, February and April, somewhere in there, because in April we, we were at Okinawa. Okinawa. Yeah. Why did you? Why did you go into Iwo? Uh, once again, to deliver some material or so, whatever it was at the time. I just don't recall. And uh, then we would, you know, go back to the either pick up more troops from a, a personnel carrier or uh, more supplies from a say a refrigerator sh uh, provision ship. You got to Iwo then uh, right after the battle because. Yeah. April hadn't come yet. Yeah. Uh, you saw Surabachi and the remains oh, yeah. of everything. Can you tell us what Iwo looked like shortly after the battle? Uh, we didn't spend too much time there, but we, uh, it was, uh, well, it was different. Uh, there wasn't a, it wasn't a palm tree type of island. It was just a black sand. A black yeah. blah. In fact, uh, I think they uh, just, they were doing the airfield because uh, that's where uh, they picked up their escort, the people from uh, Saipan and Titi and uh, B-29s. Then the, I think it was P-51s that were stationed at that's correct. Uh, Iwo and uh, they'd pick up their escorts there. And uh, there was a lot of uh, crazy flyers there because I, they used to come out because you never flew over a convoy if you had any smarts because you'd just get shot out of the air, you know. And uh, these guys would come out, of course, it was near the end of the war and we knew they were friendly or something, but they would buzz ships and they would, you know, just, and uh, my God, they, they took a lot of chances, these P-51 guys, <laughs> they bounced around pretty good. You were in, in that period just before Okinawa, which is, I think, the land, largest land battle in the Pacific. Yeah. Um, you also had the privilege of being up on the bridge. I, I say that yeah. in that you knew what was going on. How did you hear about the rest of the war that you didn't look out the porthole and see? How did you know what was going on? Well, there was Armed Forces Radio. There was Tokyo Rose that we used to listen to all the time, and uh, because uh, being in the amphibs, we were headed up to uh, Okinawa and got there, like I say, a couple of days before D-Day, and uh, we we were kind of by ourselves, and uh, we're listening to Tokyo Rose one day, and she just says she was playing records by Tommy Dorsey, and she said, "Let's make it." hot for the maestro, we're going to give them hell tomorrow, and everybody's looking at each other. We're supposed to be on some kind of a nobody knows where we're going business, you Except know. Tokyo Rose. <laughs> Except Tokyo Rose. <laughs> when you sailed from a place, you, you leave a port. Yep. And, okay, you're up on the bridge, so you, you have privileged information. Did you always know where you were going? Because you're plotting the ship, right? Pretty much so. Uh, but on most occasions, uh, you did not open. Uh, the captain would go on the um, ashore, get his uh, instructions and orders, and then maybe in a general direction, say they'd say sail south for a day or so. Then you would open them and find out where you were going, really. And then you would plot your uh, course as in. And, and sometimes you went uh, with just a, a, a few ships, otherwise times you were in a big convoy. All right, you're standing there looking at a table with a chart, a chart the room. Pacific, yeah. and you're a bright guy, and <laughs> you know we've taken Iwo. Yeah. And didn't you have the temptation to look and see there's this big island called Okinawa up there that perhaps we would go there next? Oh, it was, it was almost like, uh, that was 
the logical stepping stone. Uh, it was it was a secret, but it wasn't a secret. And uh, of course, when you got there and how you got there was a you know I'm sure they didn't advertise that, but uh, like you say, somebody had to sell Tokyo. <laughs> yeah, I got to ask you a question that um, in my notes about our talk today. It says you were at Okinawa two days before D-Day. That would bring it up to March 30th of yep. 45. What was your ship doing there two days before D-Day? We had the, uh, an army group of uh, 155 howitzer, long tom uh, howitzers, and uh, we landed at a place called Kamayamashima, which is a little island across from Okinawa itself and set up these uh, long toms, uh, the army did, they had their prime movers which dragged them off the ship uh, and uh, we, uh, they shelled Naha which was the capital of uh, Okinawa for a day and a half or so once they got set up and uh, Before the first of April? Yeah, before, so yeah, they were just bombarding the city to soften it up for the invasion. I, I'm going to ask you a, a, an odd question here, but is this generally known? I've, I've never read that there was fire on the island before the 1st of April. Uh, did people know, know what you guys known. did that day? Or? There was uh, several uh, LSMs that were, d that were there, yeah. and. Uh, in fact, it, like I said before, it was uh, April Fool's Day, Easter Sunday morning, and boy was I glad to see the sun come up on Easter Sunday morning, and April Fool's Day and D-Day, all in one. And, uh, and actually, be, and we had the ship uh, loaded with all the ammunition for the 155 uh, howitzers and they were all fused because they didn't want to spend the time to fuse the shells before they used them. So we were a, a sitting ammunition ship at the moment. You were a floating bomb. Yeah, and uh, we were, you know, and they wouldn't let us off the beach and we were being, uh, you know, shelled, but the theory being that you could run into one as, as well as you could avoid one. So, uh, and we had one guy that uh, got a little angry with the captain because he, uh, he made us stay there, you know. And it was the thing to do, but sometimes uh, you just don't uh, think that's the right decision <laughs> when you're in jeopardy. Did he express his decision to the captain? Oh. Uh, you didn't say too much to captains in the Navy because they were God. They, you know, they, the captain of a ship is the most autocratic person in the world. He, he owns that ship and everybody on it. Uh, this kid, uh, he was a, fellow, a cowboy from Wyoming and uh, he was a rough and ready character, but uh, he was, uh, going to vent his feelings on the captain, except we convinced him otherwise, because he would have been... He'd be at Portsmouth. Yeah, yeah. he would be dead meat. <laughs> at Okinawa, the Navy lost a lot of ships from kamikazes. Yes. Can you tell us about seeing any of that? Yes. Uh, one day I saw a destroyer. What, what was known... Uh, the way it was set up is the periphery was known as the picket line and they would have destroyers out there and they would intercept the incoming uh, bogies, the Japanese planes. And uh, I saw one uh, was almost like a football play. One kamikaze went into the, and the next kamikaze followed it and the whole front of a destroyer just r rolled up, it didn't sink but it, it went all the way back to the, uh, the deck just folded up and it was almost back to the bridge 
which was about midship. And uh, then other times, uh, that's when we knew that even the little ships were getting picked on because I saw a, uh, oh, I guess it was loaded with fog oil and ammunition on LST and that just burned for God knows days and blew up, uh, you know, a section at a time and, uh, and then there was a whole ton of ships that got nailed in the, the kamikaze because that was the last stand to Okinawa. Was there any warning to you that they were coming? You're sitting there oh, working yeah. and uh, what did the alarm, the general quarters yep. go off or the, something? The, the people on the picket line and also the larger ships were the, the more sophisticated radar, we had a very basic radar, uh, would, you know, you'd be on the radio and you would hear the, and they would uh, have a, a specific point where they would report their at Point Bolo or something of that nature. Then the next report would come in and they would almost track them coming in. And then uh, you'd hear the, the destroyers out on the picket line start there and then as you got closer to the where we, the anchorage where we were that would be did your ship ever hit anything we shot down uh, on uh, see okinawa uh, there's a whole bunch of islands there like the philippines in the archipelago there's seven thousand islands of which only two thousand have names like you would go into an island almost and you wouldn't even know the name of the island because it it didn't have a name well uh Besides Kami Yamashima that I just told you about, there was another little island called Aishima where Ernie Pyle was killed. Yeah, I wanted to ask you about that. That was April 16th. So April 16th. Two weeks into the battle. Yep. Uh, we were there. You were there. And uh, in fact, we were, uh, we were on a con one day when, the, and the Marines used to have a couple guys that would sail with us. They were either pharmacist mates or signalmen. They used to call them beach jumpers. They would go in and they would actually have a, a Marine outfit on, but a Navy Crow, uh, the pharmacist, the, or a, a signalman. And I remember this guy on Aishima because what they did was the, the Japanese let them land and then once they got somewhat inland, then they come out of their caves and everything else behind them, right? And I can remember this Marine fellow up there with just his hand out of it like a dugout on a light sending us the, the blinking message, just sniper in area, right? And then just then, right up on the con, and it, we took a, you know, just put a hole in one of our flags, our signal flags, that right over our heads. So needless to say, everybody scrambled to get out of there. But, uh, and then once it quieted down, we went, all went on the beach at Aishima. And uh, when I say all, you, you know, if you weren't on duty, you'd, just because the bow doors are open and the ramp is down, so you can just walk out onto the beach. And, uh, We'd go over there, and they uh, they erected a, a little cross, like or a sign that said, uh, I think it was, was some army division. We lost a friend, and it was on Earl marked where Ernie Pyle was killed by a sniper. Now, did you know who Ernie Pyle was? I knew of him. Yeah. I didn't, you know, I knew uh, because uh, you would get some. Uh, news either on the radio or and then they would have a byline or something mm -hmm. and uh, we also uh, when you asked me once before about uh, what did I know about what was going on in Europe I had some friends that were in the Air Force and uh, they would write to us with the v-mails the little photographic things they used during the war to send back and forth and uh, that basically is, uh, you know, why you would hear the news. After Okinawa, uh, I suppose you suspected you were going to Japan. 
We did go. Get ready for yeah. it. Um, tell us about leaving Okinawa. I'm leading you up to a, a, a there's a, a storm in your future. <laughs> and I want to be sure we cover that today. Well, we uh, loaded up some ambulances on Okinawa and took them into uh, Yokosuka, which uh, was their Annapolis, where they trained their uh, naval officers. So the war is over then? The war? No. It, no? it was just about over, yeah. It, uh, let me see, how did that time frame work? I, oh, we went from uh, Tokyo Bay to Yokosuka, and uh, that was it. And of course, they were still frightened of us the, when we went on, because once again, when you're unloading, you can just get out on the ramp or in the, onto the beach. And uh, they, uh, it was a, I remember going through a series of caves that uh, they actually had a hospital down underground. They had, um, this is at Yokosuka. And, uh, and uh, oh, they had machine shop. They had anything you could have dreamed of that was underground. And uh, some, uh, some fellows from some of the ships decided that because there, like I say, was their Annapolis, and where they trained their officers, mm -hmm. and they had some uh, the ships that were, you know, in their history was famous, and they had all kinds of uh, swords and with uh, jewels and everything else in them. Some of the guys got nailed for stealing them. And they right. Uh, they that that was frowned upon, <laughs> and uh, but uh, none from our ship, I might say. But uh, and then at uh, Tokyo, when we went in, and like I say, some people on our ship, and I don't know, I I we were one of the first ones that went in because, uh, needless to say. It was easier to send in an amphibious thing than it was to send in a battleship or a carrier or a cruiser. And uh, along the the hills going into Tokyo Bay, they had them uh, put up white sheets for like uh, to mark their gun emplacements. And it was like sailing into just. It was looked like it was snow on the mountain. Nobody ever would have got into. It would have been a disaster if we ever went into Tokyo Bay. And some people ask me what my thoughts are about the Nagasaki and Hiroshima. From me, from my viewpoint, that was the best thing that ever happened, as far as we were concerned, because that was a totally fortified uh, and. Uh, I don't see how anybody could have ever gotten through there because you had a sail between uh, mountains almost on each side to get in there. And uh, it was uh, just one, like I say, one huge mass of white sheets or whatever, the muslin, whatever they used to, to indicate their positions. They were, they were waiting for you. Oh, big time. Yes. When we started this talk, did you, were, you want a drink of water? Yes, sir. sure. When Just we, a moment. Go ahead. When we started this talk, we we remarked that it it's the the anniversary of the date of the sinking of your ship. Uh, is that correct? Correct. Tell us about that. We were. Uh, back in Okinawa after the signing of the peace treaty in Missouri and uh, Tokyo Bay and we're back in Okinawa once again going to bring more material into either uh, because some of the ships went to China and some went to uh, Japan and uh, we knew of the storm and uh, I guess the weather people thought it was, uh, you know, was going to bypass. We were, or the capital ships go out to sea during a storm because they don't want to be caught in port. In, uh, and uh, the smaller ships usually stayed in the, the anchorage and uh, the sheltered area. 
We started out, were ordered back in because I, at the time, I guess they thought it was going to uh, just uh, go around us, the Typhoon Louise. Where specifically were you? We were in Buckner Bay. Okay. And we were going to leave. We started out and then we were ordered back for some unknown reason. And once we were trapped in there and then uh, we were anchored, the anchor chains broke, the stern anchor broke. Uh, we were like a cork just being blown all over. And uh, the wind, they say, blew a hundred and I think it was 60 knots an hour when the weather station blew away. And they never knew how much, how, at least I never knew, how fast the wind blew after that. And of course the seas were ridiculous. And being in the, up in the con, in the pilot house, I, I could see we're going like a, a runaway freight train, but we had no control of where we were going. We were just being blown there, you know, and the, tie, uh, the waves taking us there. And uh, it was, uh, oh, I don't know, we just did that for God knows a few hours and uh, you were at the mercy of the wind. And, uh, is this daytime? Yeah, this is daytime. And we just, then we got blown onto a reef and it tore out the bottom of the ship. And then the wind changed direction and blew us out to sea. Oh, and that happened. It went down, and uh, I can remember one. There was a fella that uh, he went to jump for a life raft. He just got blown away. Nobody ever saw him again. He just went another fella was a uh, electrician's mate. He was uh, well. There was a 55-gallon drum full of gasoline that was like floating. In the, like a leaf, it was just being blown. And that, that killed him. And then another guy, uh, uh, he got into a small boat because uh, he couldn't make the life raft. And you know, it was what they call a wherry. It's a, uh, I don't know, about a 12, 15 foot little rowboat. And that was, he was gone. So there was about four that didn't make the original. Uh, I I jumped off uh, and I didn't have to jump too far because theoretically in the Navy a quartermaster is supposed to escort the captain off the ship oh, when really? it's sinking. Right. I wasn't waiting for the captain. <laughs> right after you, sir. <laughs> uh, and uh, believe it or not, when I jumped, uh, I landed in two. I. I landed in two rafts, one leg in each one. They were tied together like, and then I'm, the guy that jumped after me, he misses, he goes down, and the two rafts are banging each other, and his head is getting squashed in between the two rafts, so we got him out. But uh, then a raft is usually held onto the ship by what is known as a sea painter. It's, uh, it's actually just a line, a rope with a pelican hook on the end of it that you know, if you hit the, you know, the hook flies open and the raft goes up. Well, there was such pressure in the water and the wind that you couldn't get any slack. So the captain, he just took a fire ax and cut the, and then we took off on a sleigh ride because that was still blown and the waves are still going. And we had Cape Ock life jackets. They were big bulky, I don't know if you remember them from World War II, they were just, they had a big collar around them and a big, uh, and they were filled with Kapok, which was a flotation device, and uh, a belt to keep them, and a uh, tide, and usually as the waves hit you, I got a scar on the head, they just, uh, it just bangs you. And the, and uh, I, uh, I thought I solved the problem of the jacket coming up and banging me in the chin. And I just hooked it onto the belt from the, 
that went around the life jacket onto my belt on the pants. All I did was get myself the greatest wedgie that ever happened in the whole world. <laughs> it sounds like Seinfeld. So we corrected that immediately. And, uh, and uh, that, that night, uh, we uh, just fl floated around. And uh, I still have, um, uh, in each life raft, there is a little pack which contains a mirror which you're supposed to shine. Uh, I, got, I still have that mirror with the lanyard that went around my neck. It's a little hole in the middle. Yeah, hole in the middle, and you just, uh, and uh, we saw a few planes fly over. They didn't see us, of course. That's like looking for a needle in a haystack. And uh, eventually the USS Vestal, which was a destroyer repair ship, uh, brought us aboard. I, uh, I climbed up a cargo net. But as I was climbing up, as I was getting out of the raft, because the water was still you know, in a turmoil, one of my best buddies and I, uh, somehow or other, he panicked and he grabbed me around the back. And now the both of us are back in the water. And uh, finally I got rid of him and I went up and he, he survived. In fact, this, just last week I was out in Minneapolis. Five of us showed up for the reunion. And there's about, there's, I guess 10 of us left and, you know, their wives are sick or they're sick or something. It's the superannuated set at the moment. How many, uh, how many survivors after that day? That is to say, how many of you were lost when the ship went down? Uh, four. The guys who tried to... Yeah. Got blown away. Yeah, the yeah. guy that got blown away, the guy in the little boat, the uh, electrician's mate, and I'm trying to think of another guy, who, uh, whoever it was. So you were pretty lucky. Yes. And uh, where did the where did the ship that picked you up take you? Back to Okinawa or what? You know, the five of us twi tried to recall out we were just this past week in Minneapolis how we got from that ship back on to Okinawa, because uh, after Typhoon Louise, there was nothing in Okinawa. All we had was, uh, I had an Army baseball hat on, uh, uh, dungarees, and, uh, and that's all we owned, a shirt and a tongue. And you know, everything from latrines to hospitals, everything was blown away, there was nothing there. And we lived in tents on the beach. Uh, but the question was, how did we get from the ship to the beach? And we, none of us could remember. remember. Yeah. And it obviously wasn't the Vestal didn't just pull up to a dock because there were no docks. And uh, whether they transferred us to another ship or what, none of us could recall that. And the first thing they did when they rescued us was give us a couple double shots of whiskey. I don't know why. So it was all worthwhile? <laughs> it was all worthwhile. <laughs> but they cut your clothes off, obviously, and, uh, and uh, whether that was the thing to do or not, I don't know, but it, they did it. And, uh, and like I say, we lived on the beach until we come home on a troop transport. That's quite an adventure. Um, did you go home and get discharged? To, no, they uh, sent us... Uh, back to Treasure Island, which is outside of San Francisco. And uh, we got our clothing and reissued to us and everything else. Uh, and they sent us home on 30-day survivor leaves. And, uh, and, you know, after the 30 days, I, I was convinced I would never go to sea again. I didn't care what they did to me. And, uh, but I, they sent me to a, what they call a repo depot, a replacement depot in uh, Philadelphia. And all you had to do was uh, show up and see if your name was on a draft list because they, were, cause they couldn't get rid of 12 million guys all at once. And, uh, and they, I don't know if you recall, but they had a point system. Mm -hmm. 
you got so many points for how many years you were in, you got so many points for each medal, and et cetera, et cetera. And I'm counting my points, I'm, I want out, you know. And uh, I see my name on a, a draft, and I, I was convinced I, would, I wouldn't go, but I did. I don't know what changed my mind. And uh, it turned out, I'm in Philadelphia, I get sent across the, the country by train to pick up this ship who had a milk run during the war. All they did was run from uh, provisions from San Francisco to Honolulu and back and forth. And uh, there was another kid from Chicago and I, he got banged up, he was at Guadalcanal. And he, we're looking at each other, why are we getting, going back to sea when you know, we're ready to come home? And it just turns out that they took us back down through the Panama, it was a great trip, back through the Panama Canal, up through the Caribbean, landed in Norfolk, Virginia, sent to Bainbridge, Maryland, where I started out in school and was discharged from there, which was about, I don't know, an hour's train ride from where I was in Philadelphia. <laughs> I went halfway around the world to get discharged, you know. But when you think about it, they couldn't dump everybody back into civilian life at once. They were just killing time. So they were just killing time. Yeah. They were just... John, you've told us quite a story here today. I wonder if uh, going over it in your mind, of all that you've told us, is there one memorable experience more than anything else that you think about? Being in a raft. Uh, the raft was a, a balsa thing with a lattice floor in it like. It wasn't a rubber raft as you would visualize or a big lifeboat or anything else. So basically you were in the water all the time. And it was a seven man raft and we had 14 guys hanging on to it. Uh, some guys uh, were from swallowing salt water and all that were sick and vomiting and all this other nonsense that uh, usually they stayed in the raft. I was hanging on it mostly and I, uh, and like I say, being a 20 year old kid, I wasn't ready to die if I could help it. But I had serious thoughts and I started to uh, rationalize. Uh, I'm saying to myself, I don't wanna drown. But at the same time, being in the water, it was cold. Now the sun was hot, but there was a current there or whatever it was, the water was cold. And believe it or not, the most, probably not the best thing to say, but the greatest feeling, of, I urinated in my pants to keep my legs warm. It was the greatest feeling in the world. And uh, I was thinking, if I don't wanna drown, maybe, Freezing isn't the best, you know, you start, and then I can also, thought cross my mind, if I had a gun, I'd shoot myself, because that would be the quickest way, right? And, uh, of course, I guess it's, uh, in a situation like that, you can rationalize anything. <laughs> and, uh, obviously, I, we just hung on, and we got picked up. With, uh, at what rank were you discharged and with what? I was a quartermaster third class. And with what? <coughs> which is equivalent to a buck sergeant in the army. It's a three stripe, it's a, uh, well it's only one in the, and in those days we had what we called right arm rates. I was a right arm rate. Uh, and uh, the more technical ones like the radar men, the radio men, they were left arm rates. And I guess the old Navy was the considered the right arm rate was the guys that ran the ship or something, or some tradition of that sort. What decorations did you have, John? Oh, I got the, uh, the you know, the Pacific War, the American Theater, the uh, Philippine uh, Presidential Unit Citation, uh, Philippine Liberation, the Pacific with uh, two battles, two battle stars. 
the Philippine had a battle star, the Philippine, uh, then uh, the occupation uh, medal for uh, Asiatic occupation. And uh, there were six of them all together anyway. Did I hear good conduct in there anywhere? No. He had to be in the, uh, to uh, get a good conduct medal in and he had to be in, uh, I think it was either three or four years. It was a full hitch. And uh, I had a couple, couple of captain's masks anyway, which uh, is a minor infraction of some of the rules. We used to... Uh, it's not quite a court martial, but don't it, do it no, again. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's a slap on the wrist. One, yeah. a guy, uh, a boatswain mate and I had a personality conflict, and I had been on the wheel all night long, keeping the big, the ship on the beach, and he wanted, and I just went to bed. And he come around and he told me to wake up, and I said, no, I'm not waking up. And then we got in a little argument over it. And uh, so he put me on report, refusing orders, blah, 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 and all that. That's not bad. Nah. And the, the officer that was with me, the, the officer to the deck, he says, hey, the guy just went to bed, get off the nonsense, and it went away. But it's recorded. So other than that, had a pretty good record, but no good conduct. Very good record, in fact. When weighed against eternity, that's pretty small business. Yeah. John, we've been talking 90 minutes. Is there anything I haven't asked you that you'd like to tell your family or historians or somebody about uh, your time in the service? Well, I'll tell you, since Growing up in a small town and being in an atmosphere that everybody was really into the war effort, uh, I think that uh, if you did not participate, you were just, I don't know, just not with it. Uh, I would never want to see another one, although what they're doing now I, they, has to be done, but I would be very leery of uh, wanting anybody to go to war. But I would definitely not let them do what they did to us either. So with this uh, being, uh, this call up now that's being enforced, I, I'm all in favor of because you just can't sell your freedom down the drain. And, uh -uh. John Kennedy, thank you very much for being here. Thank you.